And certainly good to be here again. Good to have everybody out with us. Uh, if you're following us on YouTube or if you're visiting, we want to welcome you and invite you to be back anytime you can or anytime you're in the area. Uh, I was watching the Reds game yesterday. I don't know, maybe some of you did that as well. But uh, at the bottom of the eighth inning, the Reds were getting beat six to nothing. And Yasiel Puig was up to bat, and he had a 3-0 and count. In other words, one more pitch, and he's taking a, uh, his base. And uh, uh, Strop, the pitcher of the Chicago Cubs, decided it was time to, to stir up a little controversy, and he plunked him uh, right in the hip. It, wasn't, it almost went behind him, so it was kind of an obvious thing. And, uh, of course, I don't know if you watched Reds baseball or not, but Puig lost his mind, which would be typical Puig. And... Uh, all of the benches emptied, and even they come running from the from the uh, the bullpens in the outfield, which I always thought that was funny because these here are these guys running full speed to get into a fight, and they're having to run a hundred yards away. So by the time they get there, they're going to be so tired they won't be able to do nothing but watch anyway. So, but uh, and no punches was thrown, but it just showed a little bit of a lack of self control on. Yasiel Puig's part. And if you watch the Reds, they play again today at, at 1 o'clock, I think. You can guarantee in the first three innings, uh, Chicago's, one of Chicago's star players is getting plunked. And it's going to all start all over again. Of course, that's just baseball. But self-control is what I was talking about there and what I used that to express the, uh, the example. Uh, a lot of times we as Christians find ourselves getting beat 6 to nothing in the bottom of the 8th and three and no count, we get plunked, and we lose our minds, don't we? And it happens to all of us. Seems like when we're down, something kicks us and makes it a little bit worse, even when things look like they're going to get a little bit better. And that's not uncommon. It happens to everybody. But self-control, and that's what I want to look at this morning, is something that, well, it's a fruit of the Spirit, but it's something that that we as Christians must be able to display. And we have an aid or a help in that, and we're about to find out. If you want to go ahead in your uh, Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And you should be familiar with this. This is lists the fruits of the Spirit. Paul writes here to the church at Galatians, says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And when we look at that, a lot of those tie right in, though it doesn't list in the King James Version. There may be other versions that list self-control uh, as one of those fruits of the Spirit. And I believe that it really is. And if you look at our society today, and especially for those that are uh, associated in the educational uh, world, school system, self-control is something that we don't see a lot of children able to display because it's not being taught, because it's not being seen in their own homes. But it's something certainly we as Christians should try to teach and try to uh, especially uh, show that as well. We're going to look at a familiar story about self-control this morning, and, and you've heard me talk about Cain and Abel before. Genesis chapter 4 is where uh, the bulk of this will come from as we look at self-control and how it can be so destructive, but also how that we can have self-control. You can kind of look at the Cain and Abel as an example of what not to do more so than what to do. But Genesis chapter 4, beginning verse 1, and I'll just read this, and uh, we'll go through, back through it. Verse 1 says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground as an offering unto the Lord, and Abel also brought the firstlings of his flock, of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt not be accepted. 
And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? And the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And we'll stop right there. So we see here just very few verses actually talk about Cain and Abel. Of course, they're referred to later on in, in the scriptures. But as we look at this, we see that, that we have uh, two brothers born. One was a tiller of the ground. One was keeper of the flocks. An offering was made. One was accepted and one was not, which led to tempers flaring and a murder occurring. Now, I'm, I'm not real concerned today about any tempers in here flaring to the point that you would be willing to kill somebody. But, and that's not really the part of self-control that I'm talking about. We'll look at these guys as, a, as a, an example of what not to do, but really from a different perspective, looking at real-life things that we really have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And one thing that I think the Scriptures can show us, the first thing how, do I, how can I exercise or how can I learn self-control in verses 3 and through 5 is that we have to stay alert. It says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and an offering unto the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and of his offering he had not respect. And Cain was mad and his countenance fell. What's the difference in those two offerings? I don't think it matters that, that one brought fruit of the ground, grains, maybe grapes, apples, whatever that they, they raised, and the other one brought lambs or, or calves or whatever. I don't think that was the instance that God liked the meat sacrifice over the other sacrifice. The simple fact, if you notice, there was something that was mentioned the firstlings of the flock, the best of the flock is what concern was contained in one offering. But there was no notation of that about Cain's offering, was it? He just kind of brought what he, what he brought. There wasn't a lot of thought toward the way I read this. There wasn't a lot of thought toward what Cain brought as an offering. But Abel brought his firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. Of course, we know that fat way back then was really important uh, because of the energy that it provided if you used it for food, but you could also use it uh, to make other things and waterproofing and that sort of thing. We, we look, overlooked those sorts of things, but it was a very important thing, and I think it was necessary uh, that we, we mention that to see that Abel really gave something of great importance, but Cain maybe didn't take so much thought toward what his offering was. So we have to stay alert. We have to stay alert to what our hearts are and, and how our attitudes are toward God and our service to Him. Are we truly giving our best effort in whatever we do for the Lord? When we start, and when we start with God and we finish with God, we're going to be more successful. And when we stay alert to what our heart is saying, when we stay alert to what our heads are telling us to do or not to do, then we will be more successful. We see here that Cain didn't necessarily do that, and he was upset about it. Why was he upset? He was upset because God didn't find his offering pleasing, his burnt offering pleasing. Was it God's fault or was it Cain's fault? How many times whenever we find ourselves in similar situations to where we maybe are getting a review at work or we've uh, had an instance of talking with people that they don't accept our point of view and we get upset about it, is our point of view in line with God's point of view or is it our point of view? We have to be aware of those kinds of things. We have to stay alert to those in 
uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Peter wrote this, and we will be looking back and forth into the uh, Old Testament from the New Testament as well. Give us a little more practical. He says, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walk about seeking whom he may devour. When we get in a position that we lose self-control, that opens the door for the devil to come in and make the situation worse. Whatever the situation is. Now, a lot of times we associate self-control with anger, don't we? I mean, probably, if I asked you what does self-control mean, it would, you, most everyone would say, well, it means I, I don't have a bad temper and I don't lose my temper and I don't get angry and say things. And that's correct, but that's not all. Self-control covers everything that we do that would be contrary to the Word of God, everything that we do that would be contrary to the teachings of Christ. Yes, it does have to do with temper, but really being angry is not sinful. It's how we react to that anger, right? Be angry but sin not. We can be angry. That's a natural emotion. What about self-control? And, and I'm just going to go over just a couple of quick things. What about self-control with food? Sometimes I know I have a hard time with food, okay? I know you would have a hard time believing that, right? <laughs> but <clears throat> self-control. I just like good food. And I will eat sometimes to the, to the point that I can make myself sick eating because I just like food but you have to exercise self-control uh, and of course like I said anger temper and it seems that as we get older that that gets better with most people what about self-control with prayer Bible study now that's something different and we probably we don't even think about self-control in those areas but it takes as much discipline to do something as it does to not do something. So we have to be under self-control to say, okay, I'm turning off uh, Wheel of Fortune and I'm going to study my Bible for 30 minutes. Or I'm not going to do this activity today because I'm going to devote that time to prayer. Self-control. So there's a lot of different areas, a lot of different angles that we look at things that it can, can be. And remember that the devil is walking about and looking for an open door. One thing that I don't preach about a lot in this pulpit that I decided that I would today because it is so important, or not important, but it's so prevalent in our society is about self-control with sexual sin, lust, and pornography. Those are three things you've probably heard me preach on at least one time or less since I've been here. And I've been derelict in my duties because of that. But even in small town Kentucky, a little community of Kiwi, those things cause problems in our households. Pornography is slathered all over our internet, and everything that we do is connected to the internet. Seen a commercial on TV last night advertising ADT is what it was, but you know we can control so many things with our telephones and our iPads and our computers. You can lock and unlock your house. You can set the thermostat. You can set the lights to come on. You can bank. You make motel reservations. Everything is done on the computer, and the devil knows that. And the opportunity for us as adults and our children to see things, unwanted things, things that they shouldn't be seeing, things that they shouldn't be experiencing are there. And sadly, many of the times those doors are opened up from a parent. People in this church. I'm not, I don't know who, but I just know the statistics. I know what happens across all of America. And statistics tells us there's someone in this room today that has a problem with pornography. Self-control. 
there's someone in this room today that has a problem with, with lust of the flesh, which we're more familiar with. That's a lot easier term, isn't it, for me to say that, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. But what that, re what that really is in this real world today is the lust of sexual sin, adultery, pornography, pedophilia. How many times do we see that? Charges. Right here in Laurel County, open the paper and read. It's a problem here as well. Make sure you teach your children self-control to stay away from this stuff because it will destroy your life. It only builds and builds and builds. Be sure you teach children self-control. Be sure that we as adults exercise self-control when it comes to those areas because the devil is like a roaring lion and he will use that to devour you, your family, your children, and maybe even your job. So we have to be aware of it. We can't just not talk about it and hope it doesn't affect us because it will and it does. So stay alert. Search your heart, Genesis 4, 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why aren't you mad? Why are you mad? Why is your countenance fail? Why, why you got the old sad face, the old pooch mouth? What's wrong with you? We have to ask ourselves that. What am I mad about? What am I not allowing myself to, to take control over myself about? What am I giving up to not be pleasing unto God? Or what am I substituting? Okay, there we can go back. Well, I really like to watch Alex Trebek. Uh, Jeopardy's one of my favorite shows. Okay, that's fine. Watch Jeopardy. Turn the TV off afterwards and study your Bible. Of course, I'm just using those as examples. But what is it that we're willing to give up to be pleasing unto God instead of asking God to be accepting to us so that we can do something that we really is of no benefit anyway. Why, is he, why are you mad? Look what he says when he goes on. Uh, you know, sin hides in the deepest recesses of your heart. And you can't rid yourself of those tendencies until you get there and those tendencies until you look. He says, if thou do well, Thou shalt shall you not be accepted, and if you don't do well, sin lieth at the door. So if we're out trying to be pleasing to God, if we're exercising self-control, we will be accepted. But if not, what does God say to him? Sin lieth at the door. It opens up the door for us to continue and, and really go on and be more uh, or less pleasing to God. Look at... Uh, what Paul wrote to the Galatians 5.17. Kind of there where we just started off a little bit before. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you should or would. The flesh and the spirit are not compatible. They're, contra they're contrary. They're opposites. They work against each other. If you yield to the flesh, you cannot do what you need to do in the spirit. But also, and then the good news about that is if we yield to the spirit, we cannot yield to the flesh. See? So there's an upside to it. This is not all about downside stuff today, and I don't I want us to be encouraged that. And I know that we all have trouble in some area with self-control, myself included. We all have that. And there's an upside. We can overcome that. We can build self-control. We can do better. And we can learn. And we can learn from, from an awful example. You know, brother kills a brother. Can't get much worse than that. So search your heart. Where is your heart? What is... What's going on in there? Is it flesh or spirit? And if it is flesh oriented, then you're going to have difficulty. And if it's spirit oriented, you're going to have an easier time. Not that it's going to be smooth sailing, but you're going to have an easier time at this. If thou doest well, again, verse 7, I got a little bit of ahead of myself. 
Thou shalt, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. How is it that we know if we are doing well in God's eyes? Most likely he's not going to do like he just did with Cain, come down and talk to us. But he doesn't have to because he talked to us in both of these books right here, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if we're studying God's word and we understand what God expects of his people, then we will know that we're doing well. Why is your countenance falling? Why are you mad? If you do good, you'll be accepted. If you don't do good, sin lieth at the door. And the devil's going to have control over you and you're going to be his. Well, the only way that the only opportunity that we have to know the mind of God is to see the word of God. In Proverbs 25, verse 28. It's written, it says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Not so much here in recent memory. I guess you go back to the Bonesboro days when it was important that we had walls around our communities to keep out the things. A lot, this would be very familiar over in the Middle East, and I think the picture there shows the ruins of the city. If you had a community and you didn't have walls to protect yourself to keep an intruder out, you could be overtaken and taken slaves or killed or, or whatever the case may be. You had to have some form of protection around your city in order to keep you secure, to keep you from being attacked by the enemy. The writer of Proverbs is telling us the same way. If we don't have self-control, it's just like not having a wall. It's just like having a hole in the wall. Example, Alamo. I guess we've all seen the John Wayne movie where John Wayne is, is David Crockett and they have a hole in the wall and that's the first place the Mexicans come through is that, is that breach where that breach in the wall is and they just flow in in the movie and they go in and, and we know the ending of that. What about when we have an area in our lives that we have not exercised self-control? Where do you think the devil is going to go? You think he's going to start pecking on the strong point of view or is he going to go to the place where you're the weakest? You're going to go to a place where you're the weakest, where you're vulnerable, where you're the most vulnerable, where your defenses are the easiest to penetrate. Now you can get right down to where the rubber meets the road. You've got to look yourself in the mirror and you've got to say, where's my weak spot? Is it with my anger? Is it with my Bible study? Is it with my prayer life? Is it with what Rob said? Am I having trouble with lust of the, the flesh? Is it pornography? Is it so, where is the area that is the weakest in my life? And rest assured, wherever that weak spot is in your life, that's where the attacks are going to come from, one way or another. So that's what we have to remember, is to obey God's Word. To know the mind of God is to study the Word of God. And that builds, that puts that brick wall right back up. Just imagine somebody coming in, each time you study, you get a little stronger, you exercise self-control in that area, you just laid another course of bricks in that wall and make it a little tougher to get through. Not that you're going to do it all at once, because you're not. I mean, I'm going to be realistic. You're going to fail. The devil's going to make sure that you fail. But you're only a failure when you stop trying. You have to continue to improve yourself. Lay one more course of bricks. Praise God for that victory and then start laying the next course. And you find out how to do that through God's word. And then the last thing, and I don't say this to, to try to be, to, to be scary or anything, but there's consequences. And that's the thing about the world today. It doesn't seem, that, you know, any sin is open to anybody to do anything that to, you can imagine. Okay, let's look here at verses 9 through 12. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? And the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, 
which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto you her strength, and a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Cain said, I don't have this on there, verse 13, to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Cain's anger, Cain's lack of self-control led to murder and led to his banishment. A vagabond he would be. He would have to till the ground. And the ground would not yield its full strength. It's more than I can bear. There is consequences for sin. Rest assured. It's the pattern that we see set from Genesis all the way through to the end of Revelation. You have to get control of those things that are right now in control of you. You have to have self-control in whatever area that is because sin has consequences. We, our society says you, you make up your own righteousness. You say what's okay for yourself. There is really nothing that's, that's not allowed in our society today. If you can think it up, someone has already been doing it and there's probably not even a law against it somewhere even in the most deprived kind of uh, state of mind 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 as we close and here's the encouraging part that I want us to all take to heart and take to mind it's what Paul writes to Timothy here Reminds him, and he reminds us, he says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. We as Christians should not be fearing. Now, some of your uh, uh, translations may say self control, that sound mind. But it all ties in together. When we accept Christ, who says, Fear not, for I have overcome the world, we don't have to fear anymore. We have the power to overcome those things. Yeah, but Rob, you just don't know what a hold that has on me. No, I do not know what a hold it has on you, but rest assured, God knows what a hold it has on you, and He can help you through that, whatever the case is. And that's what He's telling Timothy. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. You have God on your side. He's given you the ability to overcome these things. And we have that same blessing as well. We can overcome. We can learn self-control. It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter how young we are. There's areas in our lives that we need to exercise self-control. And God can equip us to do that. Jesus, think about what he did when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He really prayed for self-control, didn't he? Because when you read that, when you read and that he was sweating and drops of blood, how much anguish he was in, he was saying, God, Father, give me the strength to not run off of this mountain, to run off this hill, out of this vineyard, out of this grove. Let me have self-control to go through and do what you want me to do. That's what exactly what Jesus was doing when he was there praying. When he went back and asked the disciples, could you not stay awake and just pray for an hour? He was he wanting them to pray. And he was going to pray. That gives us a good idea about self-control. A very important component to that is prayer. Sincere prayer. And we'd do well if we'd follow Christ's example with self-control. So does the Holy Spirit guide your life? found a, a quote from Max Licato that uh, I thought was really appropriate. Is it up there? God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. Now think about that. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. And we are all have the benefit of that. 
and when we're talking about self-control, he knows what your weakness is. He knows where you need to strengthen self-control, and he refuses to leave you that way. You know who does? You, you keep yourself in those positions. You don't want to change because you like it there. But remember, a vagabond all of his life. There's a consequence. So I encourage you today, I encourage you this week as we move forward into a new week to look at yourself. Give yourself an honest assessment. Where do I need to exercise self-control more in my life and work toward doing that, improving that? Lay that one course of brick this week. And next week, start on the next course. And you may not get a full course laid this week or next, but lay one brick and count that a victory. And the true victory that we know about is the victory that comes in accepting Jesus as your Savior. Having heard the word and believing, repenting of your sin, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is what guides us through this, to help us gain self-control. And then also the remission of sins. And then we walk faithful, not perfect, but faithfully until either Christ returns or work all the way in death. Now, maybe you've taken those steps, but you realize through our study this morning that, you know what, I do have some self-control issues in this area of my life, and I really want to, to improve that. Well, great. That's the purpose of the message, to make us think about improving ourselves for God's service. Work on that. You don't owe me anything. I've given what I owe you. I have tried to, to inspire you through God's word. Now you owe it to God to make the change. If you want to come down and, and receive the support of your brothers and sisters in Christ in prayer, then certainly do that. But in either case, if you have a decision to make, you have a change to make, we're going to sing 323, uh, the first and the fifth verse. If you have a decision to make, would you come as we stand and sing?